What is up? Welcome to the Existential Stoic Podcast. Do you ever struggle with happiness? Do you ever like wish you would be happy but can't seem to get there? Or you think if only I get this next thing, then I'll finally be happy? Well, today you're in luck because we're going to talk about the paradox of happiness. I'm Danny. I'm everybody, Randy. What's up, Randy? Here, Danny. Do you ever do you ever struggle with this? Because I do a lot with happiness. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's it's a constant struggle because when I don't have it, I think I'm never going to get it, and then once I get it, I'm afraid of losing it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and you know what's funny too? It's like I I think about this all the time. Because every time, like every time I teach a class on ethics and stuff, I talk to my students about it. And they all have this like I'm convinced every American has the same notion of happiness. That it's a static state of complete joy all the time that never ends. And it's like if anybody thinks about that, like logically for more than four seconds, they realize that is an ass in my mind. They must realize that's a ridiculous position. To think that there is this like place that you get to where there's no pain, no struggle, no challenges, and you're just like, yay, all the time. But that's like kind of this weird notion because I think we confuse like moments of intense joy. We confuse that with happiness. Or like, that's why I like the good life better. I like good life better. I think it's a better word, but whatever. That's semantics. So we can work around it. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a good thing to call it. And I, I think that we're sold on a regular basis. Like pretty much every commercial on TV oh, yeah. sells you, your life sucks, do whatever, buy whatever, and then you'll be happy. Every and it's curate. just like, oh, clearly, if if I see a hundred of those a day, that must be correct. My life must be garbage and I must need to do, be, or have something else in order to be happy forever after. And all those all those children's stories, happily ever after. Yeah, right. We've been told this our whole life. You just got to meet the right person. You just got to, you know, they'll come rescue you and your life will be great and whatever. Or, mm-hmm. you know, all those curated lives on social media, too, that, like, try to portray the perfect life of happiness and the perfect life of, like, parties all the time, you know, whatnot, and, like, doing nothing. And it's it's really funny, too, because, like, I, like for me, at least, like, I wonder how much we, people actually stop and think about what they really want in life, what would really make them happy. Because I think that's mm-hmm. also, like, you know, they think they want all these things because society tells them. You know, because the world tells them, the community tells them, and like, lo and behold, it may not be what you actually want. It may not even be happiness for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like happiness is by definition kind of a fleeting emotion. It's something that comes and goes, and not by really any control that we have. And uh, but it's something that we cling to, and we want really bad when we don't have it, especially. And oh yeah, when so, we don't yeah. have, yeah, you want to get out of that crappy feeling, you know, immediately. I find mm-hmm. myself too. It's funny, like, cause, like when I feel my best, it's when I'm not thinking about it. It's like when I'm engaged and just when I'm actually present in the moment, living my life. You know, that's when I feel the best. And then, like, as soon as I think about it, it goes away. <laughs> you know, it's like this. That is part of the paradox, right? <laughs> like, it's like it's like when somebody asks me, "Are you happy?" I just want to punch them in the mouth. I'm like, "Yeah, I was totally happy until you asked I was me that fine question." Until you asked, you jerk. <laughs> oh my gosh but actually like so like another reason that um that i wanted to talk about the paradox of happiness is uh, i don't remember the exact quote but it was something along the lines of like the only way to be happy or joyful or whatever it is is just to recognize that everything changes including happiness and i was like that's such that's such like a mind bender because if you want to be happy you need to realize that you're not going to be happy at some time yeah. And then realize that's okay too, or something like that. I don't know. I think, you know, I think, look, you know, every great philosophical work talks about this to some extent or another. Most of them at least do. Because it's been on everybody's mind. I think people have always struggled. I think that is comforting that people have always struggled with this question of like, what is the good life? What's happiness? But I think a lot of them land on that, that like, you know, recognizing that life has changed, right? That you're never going to have a state that lasts forever. So you have to be aware of that. But I think for for most of them, like if you look at the ancients, like the Stoics, if you look at Aristotle, Plato, if you look at Taoism and stuff, if you look at, you know, even more contemporary thinkers like Nietzsche or like Camus, I think for a lot of them, happiness, though, ends up being recognition of that and also like more character building so that you're more steady and level even when life throws change at you. So it's deal, it's handling that better. Think of it like an inner balance. That's how I always look at it. Because, like, you know, if you, if you don't have self-control or if you're not balanced, right, 
all the things life throws at you, you, you experience in extremes rather than, you know, take a roller coaster instead of like a you know, more steady line with some hills, you know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think yeah. that, that to me makes sense. Like, you know, it's, you know, that's why the Greeks called it, it was eudaimonia. It was like a success, good, flourishing life, right? Because it's a life where you're doing well. It doesn't mean you're happy all the time, but you're you're in a better place because, you know, you're able to handle things in life better than you would otherwise. Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I think age is definitely helps with this whole happiness and dealing with it because it gives you it gives you the experience of being unhappy and then realizing that eventually you get happy again. And then yeah. you get unhappy again, but then you get happy again. And then you get unhappy again, but then you get happy again. <laughs> so it gives you that experience to be like, okay, I'm feeling like a turd right now. It sucks. But you know what? It'll probably pass. And then it usually does. You know what I think age also does too? I think age, at least for me, and I, I, I don't know if you had to say, but I think you have, is that it also gives you the perspective that like, this is your life. Stop worrying about everybody else. Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. Stop trying to make other people happy. And start worrying about your own happiness, really. I think that's the other part of it. Because I think when you're young, you're worried about everybody else too much. What they think, whether they think, you know, whether they approve or whatever. And that's so detrimental, too, because you never can get happy if that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like comparison is terrible. I was yeah. reading something in one book today. Oh yeah, it was that I think it was yeah, it was that book by Martha Beck, the one oh, on finding That was a good one. It was yeah. a very good one. Yeah. Great Thanks. book. And I still have yet to do the exercises in that book. <laughs> this is my second time reading it. I still have yet to do the exercises. So clearly falling behind there. But she was talking about how they did this study. Uh and this is an interesting one. They took a whole bunch of like uh university students <clears throat> and they had half of them read like the the fashion the girls would read the fashion magazines and the guys would read the fitness magazines and then the other half would read like national geographic okay? okay so like the half that was reading the fitness and fashion magazines they were looking at these images of these people with perfect bodies who were airbrushed to oblivion and all this stuff and then the yeah. other people were looking at like pictures of frogs and like rainforests and whatever yeah so then after after they had them re looking at those books for a certain amount of time they just had them fill out a questionnaire like how do you feel about your life? How do you feel about your body? How do you feel compared with your peers and all this stuff? And all the people who read those fashion magazines were like more depressed. <laughs> like they hated themselves. They think they didn't measure up all this stuff. And then the people who read National Geographic were like totally cool with their lives. But you know what's funny? It's like, dude, it's because like, what is the goal of advertising? It's to make you think you need something that you don't need or that did not exist before. So it was not necessary. And once you realize that, what's the quickest way to make somebody feel that way is to get an emotional response. Because the emotional response is going to make you more motivated to actually do something. And so if you really think about it, the goal of those magazines is to make you feel shitty about your life. The goal of advertising is to make you feel terrible. Because if you do, you'll think that their solution will actually improve your life. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. you know, it's like, and it's hard because we're surrounded. I mean, we live in a consumer society, so you're surrounded by it constantly. You can't get away from it. And mm -hmm. I think that's where, like, you know, that's why I always go back to Camus where he talks about the absurdity of it, right? Like, this is all a construct. And it is, when you think about it, it's pretty absurd what we do, how we manage mm -hmm. it. And I think that can be very helpful kind of recognition. It's just yeah. silly. Yeah, it is very silly. There are, also, there are also two other paradoxes that I associate with happiness. Uh, one is that like you can't pursue it. So if you try and go after happiness, it just eludes you. And but then when you're not trying to get it, there it is. Yeah. And then the yeah, other I paradox that. is that I forgot. So <laughs> <laughs> that I, I slipped my mind. There's another one. Maybe I'll remember it later. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think. No, I actually do. I agree with you. I think if you're trying to pursue it, it's it is very difficult to grasp because I think I think, again, what happens is when we're trying to pursue like happiness, we're living not in the moment we're living in the future. Mm. Do you ever, like, you ever think of that? Like, I know this is like it's hard mm -hmm. to. Yeah, you figured it out. You remember it. Mm -hmm. You, mm -hmm. you want to say it so you don't forget it? Well, it's the whole thing about the future. How like yeah, okay. this idea of wanting happiness 
somewhere out there, but happiness will never happen out there. So if you can't be happy right here, then you'll never be happy out there. Yeah, that's what I just that's the whole problem with pursuing it, right? Is because you're looking ahead rather than living now. And I think this is another flaw we make all the time. Because like, don't get me wrong, like, like I don't want to discourage planning. I think planning is very good. Planning can be very helpful, but planning can't involve living in the future. It has to. It has to be. A, it has to be a course that you're trying to set that's plastic that can be adjusted as needed to get to where you want to be in the future. But that might change also, right? So it has to be kind of very just like tentative. But when we're really like looking at like when we say like I'll be happy when I get X, or I'll be happy when this happens, we're putting all of our eggs in the basket of the future, and we're not thinking about well I'm going to be the same person when I get there. So like if I'm not happy, I'm not going to be happy. And I think this is another flaw we make. We think we really think happiness will be achieved through externals by acquiring mm-hmm. objects, by getting more money, by getting more popularity, by having more likes, rather than self-development and growth. And I think that's the only way to really get happiness is to work on ourselves because we can be happy. I think in, I think humans are adaptable. You can be happy in almost any situation. Almost, you know, caveat there. But like, and I think that's our problem. Like, we're not working on ourselves to to be happy. Well, when you think about it, you know, it's not this external thing that actually gives you happiness. Like, sure, the external thing is there, but it's something going on within your own body and your own psyche that's yeah. this experience of happiness. So really, it's nothing that exists outside of you right now. No, it's right? Just we have this belief that it does. It's an attitude. It's a way of responding to the world it's a perspective it's a a way of thinking about yourself yeah it's a way of being and i think it might, maybe that's a better way to say too it's like a way of being in the world you know and i think this is a i think that's our big problem we've been sold i mean you know and again i think this is consumerism we've been sold a story that you know it's all about external stuff and has nothing to do with you you know and that's kind of like a really backwards way of looking at it so a funny story for you the uh Last week, I was having a shitty day. And on that day, I remembered the saying that like all a man's problems come from his inability to sit still and do nothing. So like normally when I feel shitty, I try and do a whole bunch of stuff to make myself feel better. So this day, day I was just like, I trust that the universe will resolve this for me. And, And, you know, hours went by and I still felt really shitty. And I still felt really shitty. And like pretty much the whole entire day, I felt shitty. But then around like five or six o'clock at night, it just disappeared. I didn't do anything. Yo, isn't just... that weird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that has all the and, time. And I noticed it like because I was looking for it. I was like, this will take care of itself if I just wait. And I actually waited without doing anything. And it just was gone. And then it was and then it was like such a great feeling because I was like, wow, that whole thing happened without me doing anything. We know it's funny. I think that's the other problem is like we're so we don't we we so dislike being uncomfortable that we would rather run from our feelings or hide from them rather than just sitting and experiencing them for a while and letting them be experienced. Because like once they're like experienced, they'll pass. You know, it's true. Like, you know, they always say that like grieving takes time. It takes time to grieve. You know, you never know how long, but eventually it will. It does get less burdensome. Right. You know, feeling bad one day, you're eventually the next day you probably will feel better or you probably need to eat or get some sleep or something like But Like mm-hmm. there's always something there that like once you experience it, it will go away. And I think that's yeah, it's a really good one. Yeah. Hard to do, though. It is It's hard to feel that way sometimes. But, you know, mm-hmm. I feel like I've been getting yeah. better at that, too. It's just letting myself feel that way and just like, you know. Yeah, I've gotten OK. I still hate it. I still hate when I feel oh, yeah. bad, but I've, I've like gotten. It. I've gotten more like just allowing myself to feel bad because before there was feeling bad. It was like the Buddhist thing about the two arrows. It's like, if you got shot with an arrow, would that hurt? And you're like, of course I would hurt. And it's like, well, if you got shot by a second arrow, would that hurt even more? And it's like, well, yeah, probably. (laughs) And he's like, well, that's what we're doing to ourselves. Like something bad happens. And then we get on our own case about it. Like I feel shitty. And then I feel even worse because I feel that way. And I think I'm supposed to feel some other way. So like uh, I've gotten better at just allowing myself to feel however I feel. And then just, you know, not having a, that's another good part of the paradox, right? Is thinking that we ought to be doing something different or feeling differently. 
And I do that to, I do that to myself all the time where I like berate myself for feeling bad or for being tired or like, you know, and you just make it a thousand times worse. Cause like, then you start thinking about, Oh, nothing's going to work out and all this stuff. And it's like a hundred percent of the time later on that day or the next day, I feel fine mm -hmm. and I can approach the world. And a lot of times I think it's just like, like I'm overworked, I'm too stressed, whatever these other things are going on that are making me, you know, making my imagination run wild. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, a, that's an exercise that sometimes I do from uh, Byron Katie's loving what is where like, whenever there's a stressful or whatever thought, uh, asking like what is what is the thought that i'm having and who am i when i have that thought like when for instance like when i'm feeling pissed off at somebody for something and i feel that way and then i'm like uh, I'm, I'm i don't feel like giving this example so anyways basically that's okay the idea is, give that example <laughs> yeah. so you know basically the idea the idea is that who are you when you have that thought and then who would you be without that thought and then is there any reason to ha hold on to that thought? Because most of the time, just holding on to that thought makes you feel terrible. And yeah. you realize that if you didn't hold on to that thought, you'd feel pretty good. And so it's just like you get to see like, oh, maybe I can just let go of that thought. Well, that's that's the funny thing is like, right, we do it to ourselves. And I think that's what people don't realize, too. They they want to think that like and again, this is I think this has to do with externalization, right? You want to think you're a victim. You want to think that like it's not your fault. But the reality is like you can just let go of these things. There's no reason to hold on to it. Like if you find yourself, a good example is if you find yourself getting angry while you're driving, you can let go of the anger. That is up to you. You know, you can actually <laughs> let go of it. it yeah, is you don't possible. need to go smash someone else's window yeah, or something. Yeah, like or, or just or just get work yourself up in the car and get so frustrated and angry. And then you're miserable when you get to wherever you're going because you're stressed out, right? You can literally let it go. You can laugh at yourself for being so ridiculous, right? I mean, you know, you can do so many things. And I think, there is a way to get to that point. And, and, you know, I think that's why, like, the, I do think this is why the Stoics and stuff so emphasize repetition because character, if you try these, if you do these things over and over again, it becomes easier. The first time it's hard, you know, if you're in your car and you get angry every time you drive at other drivers, the first time is going to be really difficult. But think about it like the thousandth time. It'll be easy. You'll be like, oh, <laughs> I'm doing that again. You know, <laughs> let me put on a book on tape or something or let me listen to the radio and just relax. Cause I'll get to where I'm going at some point, you know, and like mm -hmm. stop, you know, but I think we, we want to rush through everything and not experience life. And part of that is like letting ourselves go wild rather than having control over ourselves. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the, that's the gift of habits getting to do it over and over again. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that that's the paradox of happiness. It is a paradox, isn't it? It's it's so curious that it's like that's the thing that everybody wants, and it's can be sometimes so hard to attain. Yeah, it can be very hard to attain, like very difficult. Because I think we're all doing. I think most of us are doing it the wrong way. Hmm. You know, and we're looking at mm -hmm. it the wrong way because we're like buying into the stuff that you know society tells us. Is well, yeah, and also uh, also a lot of times we want happiness without putting in the work. I mean, and, yeah, that's the other problem. Yeah. Nobody yeah. wants to work on themselves, right? Because it takes time. It's difficult. And it takes a, it takes, it takes responsibility. I think that's the other thing. Nobody, you know, is saying, admitting to myself that it's me and that I have to work on myself means that I'm now responsible and accountable for it. Whereas if I can say it's the world's fault, it's so much easier, right? That's such an easier excuse than actually doing the work. But I think doing the work makes your life so much better. And I can say that with the facts. I know it's made my life so much better. You know, like it has. Mm -hmm. and I think it's true. Yeah. Yeah. There was that. There was that one thing. I think I sent it to you. The thing about oh, what the heck was it? Like serotonin? Was it serotonin and yes. Andrew Huberman? Something like that. Where basically, like, if you don't put in the work to achieve the pleasure, then it's just going to create a downward spiral. Like yeah. you think about people who are addicted to drugs or to sex or to social media or all these things, they're getting pleasures without putting in any work. But then if you look on the other hand, people who are putting in the work to get the pleasures, that's actually a virtuous cycle. Like the people who are working out or the people who are doing ice baths or the people, you know, doing whatever. So I think Nietzsche, Nietzsche said we need to like reevaluate suffering or like any of the great philosophers. They always talk about our challenges in a way that makes them positive. 
where they're not, they're not a they're not an obstacle in your path, they're a chance to grow. They're a chance to overcome yourself. They're a chance to like become a better version of you. And I think if you can think of it that way, it can make it a lot easier. Like, you know what, the next time I get angry in the car, I'm gonna just chill out and laugh at myself. And that'll be a chance to grow, right? Because instead of doing the same thing like I do every time, I'm gonna start trying to actually improve it. And it's mm-hmm. little, I think that's the other hard part is it's always little, it's baby steps, you know, but you do get there. And the more you mm-hmm. do it, like, you know, we've all, we both experienced, right? It's like that exponential snowball growth. The more you do it, the better it just gets over time. Mm-hmm. I almost feel like I'm happy most of the time. <laughs> hey, hey, that's a good one. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. Definitely don't feel as miserable as I used to be. Back when I was a victim of life and, you know, it yeah. was this thing that happened to me. I think that's good phrasing too, right? Like when you're a victim of life where you just feel like it's something that you feel like you're just in like the water getting pushed along rather than actually like determining what's going on. Yeah, because I had all these reasons, you know, I went to school and accumulate all the student loan debt and blah, 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 never pay at all. It was just a whole bunch of, you know. Yeah, it is, right? It's easy to say that though because it's so much easier to do that than actually like deal with it. It is. It is mm-hmm. easier, you know. Yeah. Way worse for you though. Yeah. So, so we're good. that's all yeah. I got on happiness. All yeah. right. Well, that's the paradox of happiness. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully you guys can start being happy. This is the Existential Talk Podcast. Check us out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Please like, share, subscribe, like, share, and subscribe. It helps us out a lot. It's like a tongue twister. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back midweek with a quick fix. I'm Danny. That's Randy. Later, buddy. Later, Danny. <laughs> awesome.